Chapters thirty nine through forty two of Foul Play by Charles Reed and Dion Boucicault. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirty nine. The very name of Arthur Wardlaw startled Helen and made her realize how completely her thoughts had been occupied with another. But add to that the strange and bitter epigram or was it a mere fortuitous concourse of words she was startled amazed confounded puzzled and ere she could recover her composure hazel was back to his problem again but no longer with the same energy he said in a faint and sleepy voice he maketh the winds his messengers and flames of fire his ministers ah if i could do that well why not i can do anything she bids me graeculus in sorian coelum useri sibite and soon after this doughty declaration he dozed off and forgot all his trouble for a while the sun rose and still he slept and helen watched him with undisguised tenderness in her face undisguised now that he could not see it ere long she had companions in her care ponto came out of his den and sniffed about the boat and then began to scratch it and whimper for his friend tommy swam out of the sea came to the boat discovered heaven knows how that his friend was there and in the way of noises did everything but speak the sea-birds followed and fluttered here and there in an erratic way with now and then a peck at each other all animated nature seemed to be uneasy at this eclipse of their hazel at last tommy raised himself quite perpendicular in a vain endeavour to look into the boat and invented a whine in the minor key which tells on dogs it set ponto off in a moment he sat upon his tail and delivered a long and most deplorable howl everything loves him thought helen with ponto's music hazel awoke and found her watching him with tears in her eyes he said softly miss rolleston there is nothing the matter i hope why am i not getting things for your breakfast dear friend said she why you are not doing things for me and forgetting yourself is because you have been very ill and i am your nurse now tell me what i shall get you is there nothing you could fancy no he had no appetite she was not to trouble about him and then he tried to get up but that gave him such a pain in his loins he was fain to lie down again so then he felt that he had got rheumatic fever he told her so but seeing her sweet anxious face begged her not to be alarmed he knew what to take for it would she be kind enough to go to his arsenal and fetch some specimens of bark she would find there and also the keg of rum she flew at the word and soon made him an infusion of the barks in boiling water to which the rum was added his sweet nurse administered this from time to time the barks used were of the cassia tree and a wild citron tree cinchona did not exist in this island unfortunately perhaps there was no soil for it at a sufficient elevation above the sea nevertheless with these inferior barks they held the fever in check but the pain was obstinate and cost helen many a sigh for if she came softly she could hear him moan and the moment he heard her foot he set to and whistled for a blind with what success may be imagined she would have bought those pains or a portion of them ay and paid a heavy price for them but pain like everything intermits and in those blessed intervals his mind was more active than ever and ran a great deal upon what he called the problem but she who had said it him gave him little encouragement now to puzzle over it the following may serve as a specimen of their conversation on that head the air of this island said he gives one a sort of vague sense of mental power it leads to no result in my case still it is an agreeable sensation to have it floating across my mind that some day i shall solve the great problem ah oh, if i was only an inventor and so you are no no said hazel disclaiming as earnestly as some people claim i do things that look like acts of invention but they are acts of memory i could show you plates and engravings of all the things i have seemed to invent 
a man who studies books instead of skimming them can cut a dash in a desert island until the fatal word goes forth invent and then you find him out i am sure i wish i had never said the fatal word you will never get well if you puzzle your brain over impossibilities impossibilities but is not that begging the question the measure of impossibilities is lost in the present age i propose a test let us go back a century and suppose that three problems were laid before the men of that day and they were asked to decide which is the most impossible first to diffuse intelligence from a fixed island over a hundred leagues of water second to make the sun take in thirty seconds likenesses more exact than any portrait painter ever took likenesses that can be sold for a shilling at fifty per cent profit third for new york and london to exchange words by wire so much faster than the earth can turn that london shall tell new york at ten on monday morning what was the price of consoles at two o'clock monday afternoon that is a story said helen with a look of angelic reproach i accept that reply said hazel as for me i have got a smattering of so many subjects all full of incredible truths that my faith in the impossibility of anything is gone ah if james watt was only here instead of john hazel james watt from the abbey with a head as big as a pumpkin he would not have gone groping about the island writing on rocks and erecting signals no he would have had some grand and bold idea worthy of the proposition well so i think said helen archly that great man with the great head would have begun by making a kite a hundred yards high would he well he was quite capable of it yes and rubbed it with phosphorus and flown it in the first tempest and made the string fast to the island itself well that is an idea said hazel staring rather hyperbolical i fear but after all it is an idea or else continued helen he would weave a thousand yards of some light fabric and make balloons then he would stop the pitch fountain bore a hole in the rock near it and so get the gas fill the balloons inscribe them with our sad story and our latitude and longitude and send them flying all over the ocean there hazel was amazed i resign my functions to you said he what imagination what invention oh dear no said helen slyly acts of memory sometimes pass for invention you know shall i tell you when first you fell ill you were rather light-headed and uttered the strangest things they would have made me laugh heartily only i couldn't for crying and you said that about kites and balloons every word did i then i have most brains when i have least reason that's all ay said helen and other strange things very strange and bitter things one i should like to ask you about what on earth you could mean by it but perhaps you meant nothing after all i'll soon tell you said hazel but he took the precaution to add provided i know what it means myself she looked at him steadily and was on the point of seeking the explanation so boldly offered but her own courage failed her she coloured and hesitated i shall wait said she till you are quite quite well that will be soon i hope only you must be good and obey my prescriptions cultivate patience it is a wholesome plant bow the pride of that intellect which you see a fever can lay low in an hour aspire no more beyond the powers of man here we shall stay unless providence sends us a ship i have ceased to repine and don't you begin dismiss that problem altogether see how hot it has made your poor brow be good now and dismiss it or else do as i do fold it up put it quietly away in a corner of your mind and when you least expect it will pop out solved oh comfortable doctrine but how about jamie watts headaches and why are the signs of hard thoughts so much stronger in his brow and face than in shakespeare's mercy on us there is another problem hazel smiled well pleased and leaned back soothed silenced subdued by her soft voice and the exquisite touch of her velvet hand on his hot brow 
poor woman-like she laid her hand like down on that burning brow to aid her words in soothing it nor did it occur to him just then that this admonition delivered with a kind maternal hand maternal voice came from the same young lady who had flown at him like a wild cat with this very problem in her mouth she mesmerized him problem and all he subsided into a complacent languor and at last went to sleep thinking only of her but the topic had entered his mind too deeply to be finally dismissed it returned next day though in a different form you must know that hazel as he lay on his back in the boat had often in a half drowsy way watched the effect of the sun upon the boat's mast it now stood a bare pole and at certain hours acted like the needle of a dial by casting a shadow on the sands above all he could see pretty well by means of this pole and its shadow when the sun attained its greatest elevation he now asked miss rolleston to assist him in making this observation exactly she obeyed his instructions and the moment the shadow reached its highest angle and showed the minutest symptom of declension she said now and hazel called out in a loud voice noon and forty-nine minutes past eight at sydney said helen holding out her chronometer for she had been sharp enough to get it ready of her own accord hazel looked at her and at the watch with amazement and incredulity what said he impossible you can't have kept sydney time all this while and pray why not said helen have you forgotten that once somebody praised me for keeping sydney time it helped you somehow or other to know where we were and so it will now cried hazel exultingly but no it is impossible we have gone through scenes that you can't have wound that watch up without missing a day indeed but i have said helen not wind my watch up why if i was dying i should wind my watch up see it requires no key a touch or two of the fingers and it is done oh i am remarkably constant in all my habits and this is an old friend i never neglect do you remember that terrible night in the boat when neither of us expected to see the morning oh how good and brave you were well i remember winding it up that night i kissed it and bade it good-bye but i never dreamed of not winding it up because i was going to be killed what am i not to be praised again as i was on board ship stingy can't afford to praise one twice for the same thing praised cried hazel excitedly worship do you mean why we have got the longitude by means of your chronometer it is wonderful it is providential it is the finger of heaven pen and ink and let me work it out in his excitement he got up without assistance and was soon busy calculating the longitude of god's sand isle forty there said he now the latitude i must guess at by certain combinations in the first place the slight variation in the length of the days then i must try and make a rough calculation of the sun's parallax and then my botany will help me a little spices furnish a clue there are one or two that will not grow outside the tropic it was the longitude that beat me and now we have conquered it hurrah now i know what to diffuse and in what direction east southeast the ducks have shown me that much so there's the first step toward the impossible problem very well said helen and i am sure one step is enough for one day i forbid you the topic for twelve hours at least i detest it because it always makes your poor head so hot what on earth does that matter said hazel impetuously and almost crossly come 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 sir said helen authoritatively it matters to me but when she saw that he could think of nothing else and that opposition irritated him she had the tact and good sense not to strain her authority nor to irritate her subject hazel spliced a long fine pointed stick to the masthead and set a plank painted white with guano at right angles to the base of the mast and so whenever the sun attained his meridian altitude went into a difficult and subtle calculation to arrive at the latitude or as near it as he could without proper instruments and he brooded and brooded over his discovery of the longitude but unfortunately he could not advance 
in some problems the first step once gained leads or at least points to the next but to know whereabouts they were and to let others know it were two difficulties heterogeneous and distinct having thought and thought till his head was dizzy at last he took helen's advice and put it by for a while he set himself to fit and number a quantity of pearl oyster shells so that he might be able to place them at once when he should be able to recommence his labour of love in the cavern one day helen had left him so employed and was busy cooking the dinner at her own place but mind you with one eye on the dinner and another on her patient when suddenly she heard him shouting very loud and ran out to see what was the matter he was roaring like mad and whirling his arms over his head like a demented windmill she ran to him eureka eureka he shouted in furious excitement oh dear cried helen never mind she was all against her patient exciting himself but he was exalted beyond even her control crown me with laurel he cried i have solved the problem and up went his arms oh is that all said she calmly get me two squares of my parchment cried he and some of the finest gut will not after dinner do no certainly not said hazel in a voice of command i wouldn't wait a moment for all the flesh-pots of egypt then she went like the wind and fetched them oh thank you thank you now i want let me see ah there's an old rusty hoop that was washed ashore on one of that ship's casks i put it carefully away how the unlikeliest things come in useful soon or late she went for the hoop but not so rapidly for here it was that the first faint doubt of his sanity came in however she brought it and he thanked her and now said he while i prepare the intelligence will you be so kind as to fetch me the rushes the what said helen in growing dismay the rushes i'll tell you where to find some helen thought the best thing was to temporize perhaps he would be better after eating some wholesome food i'll fetch them directly after dinner said she but it will be spoiled if i leave it for long and i do so want it to be nice for you to-day dinner cried hazel what do i care for dinner now i am solving my problem i'd rather go without dinner for years than interrupt a great idea pray let dinner take its chance and obey me for once for once said helen and turned her mild hazel eyes on him with such a look of gentle reproach forgive me but don't take me for a child asking you for a toy i'm a poor crippled inventor who sees daylight at last oh i am on fire and if you want me not to go into a fever why get me my rushes where shall i find them said helen catching fire at him go to where your old hut stood and follow the river about a furlong you will find a bed of high rushes cut me a good bundle cut them below the water choose the stoutest here is a pair of shears i found in the ship she took the shears and went swiftly across the sands and up the slope he watched her with an admiring eye and well he might for it was the very poetry of motion hazel in his hours of health had almost given up walking he ran from point to point without fatigue or shortness of breath helen equally pressed for time did not run but she went almost as fast by rising with the dawn by three meals a day of animal food by constant work and heavenly air she was in a condition women rarely attain to she was trained ten miles was no more to her than ten yards and when she was in a hurry she got over the ground by a grand but feminine motion not easy to describe it was a series of smooth undulations not vulgar strides but swift rushes in which the loins seemed to propel the whole body and the feet scarcely to touch the ground it was the vigour and freedom of a savage with the grace of a lady and so it was she swept across the sands and up the slope et vera in cesu patuit dea while she was gone hazel cut two little squares of seal's bladder one larger than the other on the smaller he wrote an english lady wrecked on an island west longitude one hundred three degrees thirty minutes south latitude between the thirty-third and twenty-sixth parallels haste to her rescue 
then he folded this small and enclosed it in the larger slip which he made into a little bag and tied the neck extremely tight with fine gut leaving a long piece of the gut free and now helen came gliding back as she went and brought him a large bundle of rushes then he asked her to help him fasten these rushes round the iron hoop it must not be done too regularly said he but so as to look as much like a little bed of rushes as possible helen was still puzzled but interested so she set to work and between them they fastened rushes all round the hoop although it was a large one but when it was done hazel said they were too bare then we will fasten another row said helen good-humouredly and without more ado she was off to the river again when she came back she found him up and he said the great excitement had cured him such power has the brain over the body this convinced her he had really hit upon some great idea and when she had made him eat his dinner by her fire she asked him to tell her all about it but by a natural reaction the glorious and glowing excitement of mind that had battled his very rheumatic pains was now followed by doubt and dejection don't ask me yet he sighed theory is one thing practice is another we count without our antagonists i forgot they will set their wits against mine and they are many i am but one and i have been so often defeated do you know i have observed that whenever i say beforehand now i am going to do something clever i am always defeated pride really goes before destruction and vanity before a fall the female mind rejecting all else went like a needle's point at one thing in this explanation our antagonists said helen looking sadly puzzled why what antagonists have we the messengers said hazel with a groan the aerial messengers that did the business helen dropped the subject with almost ludicrous haste and after a few commonplace observations made a nice comfortable dose of grog and bark for him this she administered as an independent transaction and not at all by way of comment on his antagonists the aerial messengers it operated unkindly for her purpose it did him so much good that he lifted up his dejected head and his eyes sparkled again and he set to work and by sunset prepared two more bags of bladder with inscriptions inside and long tails of fine gut hanging he then set to work and with fingers far less adroit than hers fastened another set of rushes round the hoop he set them less evenly and some of them not quite perpendicular and while he was fumbling over this and examining the effect with paternal glances helen's hazel eye dwelt on him with furtive pity for to her this girdle of rushes was now an instrument that bore an ugly likeness to the sceptre of straw with which vanity run to seed sways imaginary kingdoms in bedlam or bicetre and yet he was better he walked about the cavern and conversed charmingly he was dictionary essayist raconteur anything she liked and as she prudently avoided and ignored the one fatal topic it was a delightful evening her fingers were as busy as his tongue and when he retired she presented him with the fruits of a fortnight's work a glorious wrapper made of fleecy cotton enclosed in a plaited web of flexible and silky grasses he thanked her and blessed her and retired for the night about midnight she awoke and felt uneasy so she did what since his illness she had done a score of times without his knowledge she stole from her lair to watch him she found him wrapped in her present which gave her great pleasure and sleeping like an infant which gave her joy she eyed him eloquently for a long time and then very timidly put out her hand and in her quality of nurse laid it lighter than down upon his brow the brow was cool and a very slight moisture on it showed the fever was going or gone she folded her arms and stood looking at him and she thought of all they had done and suffered together her eyes absorbed him devoured him the time flew by unheeded it was so sweet to be able to set her face from its restraint and let all its sunshine beam on him and even when she retired at last those light hazel eyes that could flash fire at times but were all dove-like now hung and lingered on him as if they could never look at him enough half an hour before daybreak she was awakened by the dog howling piteously she felt a little uneasy at that not much 
however she got up and issued from her cavern just as the sun showed his red eye above the horizon she went toward the boat as a matter of course she found ponto tied to the helm the boat was empty and hazel nowhere to be seen she uttered a scream of dismay the dog howled and whined louder than ever forty one wardlaw senior was not what you call a tender-hearted man but he was thoroughly moved by general rolleston's distress and by his fortitude the gallant old man landing in england one week and going back to the pacific the next like goes with like and wardlaw senior energetic and resolute himself though he felt for his son stricken down by grief gave his heart to the more valiant distress of his contemporary he manned and victualled the springbok for a long voyage ordered her to plymouth and took his friend down to her by train they went out to her in a boat she was a screw steamer that could sail nine knots an hour without burning a coal as she came down the channel the general's trouble got to be well known on board her and when he came out of the harbour the sailors by an honest hearty impulse that did them credit waited for no orders but manned the yards to receive him with the respect due to his services and his sacred calamity on getting on board he saluted the captain and the ship's company with sad dignity and retired to his cabin with mr wardlaw there the old merchant forced on him by loan seven hundred pounds chiefly in gold and silver telling him there was nothing like money go where you will he then gave him a number of notices he had printed and a paper of advice and instructions it was written in his own large clear formal hand general rolleston tried to falter out his thanks john wardlaw interrupted him next to you i am her father am i not you have proved it well then however if you do find her as i pray to god you may i claim the second kiss mind that not for myself though for my poor arthur that lies on a sick bed for her general rolleston assented to that in a broken voice he could hardly speak and so they parted and that sad parent went out to the pacific to him it was indeed a sad and gloomy voyage and the hope with which he went on board oozed gradually away as the ship traversed the vast tracts of ocean one immensity of water to be passed before that other immensity could be reached on whose vast uniform surface the search was to be made to abridge this gloomy and monotonous part of our tale suffice it to say that he endured two months of water and infinity ere the vessel fast as she was reached valparaiso their progress however had been more than once interrupted to carry out wardlaw's instructions the poor general himself had but one idea to go and search the pacific with his own eyes but wardlaw more experienced directed him to overhaul every whaler and coasting vessel he could and deliver printed notices telling the sad story and offering a reward for any positive information good or bad that should be brought in to his agent at valparaiso acting on these instructions they had overhauled two or three coasting vessels as they steamed up from the horn they now placarded the port of valparaiso and put the notices on board all vessels bound westward and the captain of the springbok spoke to the skippers in the port but they all shook their heads and could hardly be got to give their minds seriously to the inquiry when they heard in what water the cutter was last seen and on what course one old skipper said look on juan fernandez and then at the bottom of the pacific but the sooner you look there the less time you will lose from valparaiso they ran to juan fernandez which indeed seemed the likeliest place if she was alive when the larger island of that group the island dear alike to you who read and to us who write this tale came in sight the father's heart began to beat higher the ship anchored and took in coal which was furnished at a wickedly high price by mr joshua fullalove who had virtually purchased the island from chile having got it on lease for longer than the earth itself is to last we hear and now rolleston found the value of wardlaw's loan it enabled him to prosecute his search through the whole group of islands and he did hear at last of three persons who had been wrecked on massa fuero one of them a female he followed this up and at last discovered the parties 
he found them to be spaniards and the woman smoking a pipe after this bitter disappointment he went back to the ship and she was to weigh her anchor next morning but while general rolleston was at mesafuero a small coasting vessel had come in and brought a strange report at second hand that in some degree unsettled captain morland's mind and being hotly discussed on the forecastle set the ship's company in a ferment forty two hazel had risen an hour before dawn for reasons well known to himself he put on his worst clothes and a leathern belt his little bags round his neck and took his bundle of rushes in his hand he also provided himself with some pieces of raw fish and fresh oyster and thus equipped went up through terrapin wood and got to the neighbourhood of the lagoon before daybreak there was a heavy steam on the water and nothing else to be seen he put the hoop over his head and walked into the water not without an internal shudder it looked so cold but instead of that it was very warm unaccountably warm he walked in up to his middle and tied his iron hoop to his belt so as to prevent it sinking too deep this done he waited motionless and seemed a little bed of rushes the sun rose and the steam gradually cleared away and hazel peering through a hole or two he had made expressly in his bed of rushes saw several ducks floating about and one in particular all purple without a speck but his amber eye he contrived to detach a piece of fish that soon floated to the surface near him but no duck moved toward it he tried another and another then a mallard he had not observed swam up from behind him and was soon busy pecking at it within a yard of him his heart beat he glided slowly and cautiously forward till the bird was close to the rushes hazel stretched out his hand with the utmost care caught hold of the bird's feet and dragged him sharply under the water and brought him up within the circle of the rushes he quacked and struggled hazel soused him under directly and so quenched the sound then he glided slowly to the bank so slowly that the rushes merely seemed to drift ashore this he did not to create suspicion and so spoil the next attempt as he glided he gave his duck air every now and then and soon got on terra firma by this time he had taught the duck not to quack or he would get soused and held under he now took the long gut end and tied it tight round the bird's leg and so fastened the bag to him even while he was effecting this a posse of ducks rose at the west end of the marsh and took their flight from the island as they passed hazel threw his captive up in the air and such was the force of example aided perhaps by the fright the captive had received that hazel's bird instantly joined these travellers rose with them into the high currents and away bearing the news eastward upon the wings of the wind then hazel returned to the pool and twice more he was so fortunate as to secure a bird and launch him into space so hard is it to measure the wit of man and to define his resources the problem was solved the aerial messengers were on the wing diffusing over hundreds of leagues of water the intelligence that an english lady had been wrecked on an unknown island in longitude one hundred three degrees thirty minutes and between the thirty-third and twenty-sixth parallels of south latitude and calling good men and ships to her rescue for the love of god End of chapters thirty nine through forty two